what if we could tie computing theory to, to people and teams? And you know, that's the topic of this talk, is the cap theorem of humans. So while I was ideating on this, I was listening to a, a lot of audiobooks on management theory, uh, being a first-time manager, um, which you know, I was kind of forced to, if you will, to learn more soft skills required to lead people and, and organizations and communicate effectively with others. Like, as you can see, I've only been a manager for, for six months. Um, I've been working professionally in the industry for about 13 years and spelunking on code for close to about 30 or so. Um, you can find me pretty much everywhere as Christian Witz, so GitHub, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, most importantly the ZA Tech Stack Group, you can find me around. Uh, ping me if you want to, to chat about anything, I'm generally happy to help wherever I can. So, um, brief outline of the agenda, Just first going to uh, cover the CAP theorem and then how humans differ in that context and then go through some methods that I feel are good starting points um, and how everyone can at all levels be leaders and some simple steps to aid in inventiveness and creativity uh, in this regard. So, quick recap of the CAP theorem. So consistency is defined obviously as every read receives the most recent uh, write or an error. Um, availability as every request receives a response, but with no guarantee that it contains the most recent write. Um, partition tolerance, as a system continuing to operate in the face of messages being dropped by the network. So in other words, a network partition, or in the presence of a network partition, one has to choose between consistency and availability. Humans, on the other hand, are an entirely different beast, um, mostly able to operate in uh, due to superior partition tolerance because we're independent free thinkers but we tend to suffer a lot more from the consistency and availability so humans are generally only consistent when executing the same task which is generally a rarity outside of day-to-day -day work Let's introduce a slight variance and the outcome can be wildly different humans are generally available um, but only when waiting for work, and even then not 100% of the time, as you spend some time in the ideation phase or, to be honest, watching cat videos and surfing Reddit. And their availability is severely hampered when fielding a large volume of work as context switching for humans is a lot more expensive than for computers. Where humans can easily excel, though, is obviously partition tolerance due to their free-thinking nature although it can come at a cost of consistency. As when procedures meant to protect process cannot be followed, faults can easily be injected, like doing a YOLO deploy on a Friday evening without your code going through the job process, which I'm sure a lot of us have done more than once, or you know, vimming a file in production because shit, like you need to. So in other words, humans are about as reliable as UDP. That is to say, mostly. So. Think of your organization as a distributed monolith and microservice architecture all rolled into one that needs delicate orchestration to ensure at least a passable level of communication and rate of work. The monoliths tend to be the old guard of your organization, the ones that hold the knowledge of every dark corner um, of your infrastructure and code base, know the little idiosyncrasies and the microservices tend to be your newly formed teams and squads that hopefully have razor sharp focus and tight feedback loops. But you need to break processes out so that you have to have well defined methods of communication as well as response times required from, from them. So things like email and instant messengers are great but they're asynchronous and people tend to not respond. I know I'm horrendously guilty of opening an email, reading it and replying about two weeks later, uh, you know, but you can't always go tapping on somebody's shoulder because, again, context switching is expensive for humans. You also need to know when to break the circuit and isolate work so that it can finally get done. Uh, if it takes weeks or months to get some minor feature complete because it touches many parts of the system, considering an ad hoc team derived of <coughs> members of, from responsible teams, throw them in the room together and get shit done instead of waiting for people to coordinate of, of through like long project pipelines. 
um, then to limit the amount of work which comes pouring in via some gatekeepers because no one wants to run flat out 24 seven because that tends to lead to burnout and stress and anxiety and much like I'm feeling right now. And you'll see some minor, more, more than just minor failures happening. <coughs> so for consistency, we need reproducibility. And reproducibility is hard. Like one only needs to take a look at the current projects in progress on reproduciblebuilds.org um, uh, for the various flavors of Linux and BSDs and what a mammoth task it is to make sure that things are reproducible. Um, so we look towards configuration and infrastructure as code as a first target towards consistency. Um, if we can run the same configuration tasks over and over, day in and day out, and never have a variance, like we've succeeded in the first step of consistency. Uh, we need playbooks or runbooks for handling outages and diagnosing faults. Because without such material, someone new to the organization or engineering in general will not know how to find a consistent an answer when trying to diagnose problems. Um, automated remediation systems take this a step further, such as technologies like Stackstorm. Um, and you can take your playbooks that are just sitting in a text document somewhere and actually put that in place so that you don't have to get paged uh, all the time. Your documentation needs to be accurate and up to date and you shouldn't have conflicting documentation systems. There should be a single source of truth. Um, you should ensure that ev everything along all the steps is properly documented uh, from your code itself to service boundaries and production documentation that lists caveats issues uh, as well as change logs so that if you're not on call, someone gets paged, there's a new fault in the system, they only need to look so far in order to get, well, to, to drill into the problems at hand. And this obviously includes greater architectural diagrams so that you can have oversight of all the moving pieces, the dependencies and boundaries so you don't, don't have to worry about digging into things that are irrelevant for the task at hand. So availability is probably the easiest to grok, but the hardest to practice effectively. Um, the first item is to ensure no resources are blocked for longer than they truly should be, and bottlenecks are swiftly taken care of to ensure a proper flow. Uh, controlling work in progress is incredibly important for availability. The wait time is defined as the percent of time divided by your percent, uh, percent of time busy divided by your percent of time idle. So if a resource is busy 50% of the time and it's 50% idle, the wait time is 50% divided by 50%, which is one unit of time. So if that's one hour, we can call it that. On the other hand, if the resource is 90% busy, then the wait time is 90% um, divided by 10% or nine hours. So if our task was sitting in a queue nine times longer than it's uh, you know, than if you're 50% idle. And if your task is going through seven steps and all of those steps are at the same level of busy, that change that you think is only gonna take half an hour is actually gonna take you about 63 hours just to get to the front of the queue. Uh, so there's obviously a lot of uh, story tracking software out there. I um, encourage you to go and experiment with them. Some of my favorites is uh, Clubhouse. Uh, Jira's okay. Uh, it works for what it works for. Uh, <laughs> or GitHub issues, but GitHub issues have a problem that you can't uh, cross tag issues from one repo to another, which is slightly annoying. Um, and then yeah, at the end of the day, unless it's a P1 severity issue, like no task should jump straight to the front of the queue. You shouldn't have the CEO walking in the door, banging it down and saying this, this needs to get done now. It should go through proper process, otherwise you end up uh, screening the workflow system. So with partition tolerance being seemingly easy for humans, as we have generally a, a far greater queue depth than machines to work through, we still need some help. So if you had to sit down and think of a theoretical scenario that half your organization was on a plane for 12 hours and you've got a critical uh, outage, would the other half be able to function and resolve the issues at hand? 
Um, I mean, hopefully so. It's just an outage. It's not that bad. Uh, but what happens if you were to lose half your staff? So people decide to go and quit. Um, you know, and there's a mix of all seniority levels and experience. Would you then still be able to operate? Is there, uh, <coughs> is there knowledge trapped in these people that haven't been communicated out and socialized with the rest of the organization? You know, it was stuff done back of the napkin and now you have no idea what's going on. So, so in order to resolve some of these potential failure points, the direction or roadmap needs to be well laid out and clearly mandated. So I'm not talking waterfall and having thousands of pages of documentation covering the next three years of projects you're never actually going to do because it's going to be crap by the time you get there, but rather have the next three to six months clearly defined and the next 12, 18, 24, and 36 month um, phases covered in at least a high level of detail so that people know um, sort of where the direction is going and know what to do next. So if people are away on holiday for six months or sabbatical, they don't have to worry about what are we going to be doing. So some, some tactics to employ. This is definitely not an exhaustive list, but it's just a starting point I, I kind of came up with. Um, and obviously this is like my opinion. Um, to how to better transition to that state. So, Radical Candor, I uh, don't know if anybody's read the book by Kim Scott. Uh, the byline is actually how to be a kick-ass boss without losing your humanity, um, although the boss portion can easily be substituted out with team player. It has a very, very simple idea is that in order to be a good boss, you need to care personally and challenge directly. And while there's a good tenants in the book, um, I took away some other points to that. So the first being openness, which to me is being receptive of new ideas and accommodating opinions. So if people can't make their suggestions heard, they're going to stop suggesting. And what that leads to is a failure to innovate and you end up with a sucky culture. Um, honesty, so the ability to be honest without fear, like that also stimulates a healthy culture. Um, you know, you tend to have no backstabbing, infighting, or issues get resolved fairly quickly. You don't end up in mediation meetings with HR because of uh, some nasty words spoken. Um, authenticity, being your genuine self, that helps set you more at ease. If you're not telling white lies about certain things to certain people, you don't have to keep track of that crap, and you can just get on with life and, uh, you know, div divert your energies elsewhere. So it's not draining. And so it's much better for, for me, at least. Um, then being vulnerable. So this is being able to accept somebody's honesty to you. If somebody comes to me and say, hey, they don't like what I did on Friday at 5 p.m. because I went and rolled out production changes without going through a process, I should be able to be vulnerable and accept that feedback and not you know, lash out and, and act like a petulant child. And then, obviously, a culture of feedback. So having tight feedback loops is one of the best ways to ensure items don't slip through the cracks. Without feedback, you tend to be chasing other people's tails, trying to get information out of them, which leads to context switching and juggling things, and you end up dropping balls constantly. Um, I know I'm guilty of this sometimes, where I just, I'm so stuck in my work that I forget to give status updates. Um, and actually, in 18 minutes, I'm supposed to submit a stand-up report. Uh, so failing fast is uh, one of my favorites because I'm historically bad at knowing when to kill projects. But I delight in the first point here, which is willingness to experiment. So willingness to experiment should not be seen as an affront to existing systems or processes. It's actually a great thing to have, um, and you have multiple tiers of rewards for you and your team and your organization. Firstly, you get to do something new in potentially shiny new language or framework, which I always like doing. Um, and secondly, you might, could actually yield something of value, perhaps not to the organization at this point in time, but what you experimented on might help someone else down the line. With that being said, you've got to know when to kill shit. Um, you know, if after three months of experimentation, you and two colleagues still haven't managed to write Hello World in OCaml, 
you're probably not going to get around to writing that fancy distributed lockless queue you're planning on building. Um, so don't worry about culling things. They don't necessarily represent failure um, as long as you take some learnings away from the experience, which is the most important thing. So even if that learning is rather write it in a language that you know already and then iterate on that, you know, that's, that's a valuable lesson to pull out of it. So perhaps start small with some dedicated hackathon days before going and doing it. Everyone has 20% time to do whatever they want. Just put a de deliverable on it, uh, whether it be a small presentation at the end with learnings and outcomes, perhaps full-on demos if you do something really cool. Um, but you'll get the creative juices flying and people become more willing to experiment in your organization. So blameless post-mortems. Too often we work in organizations where uh, people like to wag the proverbial finger when it comes to incidents and outages. But we need to understand that blameful culture tends towards cover your ass engineering. And your engineers end up being silent about the actions, situations, and observances of, um, of the incidents at hand. So be deliberate about your postmortems. They should be considered critical enough that you put a halt on other work to hold them and preferably do this within 48 hours of an incident so that's still fresh in your mind. Quite often I've experienced where trying to do post-mortems and we end up only getting to it three weeks later and no one can remember what the hell went on because we probably didn't do enough documentation during the incident anyway. So develop the fundamentals of post-mortems. If you've got the mechanics memorized, um, in other words, things like the meeting format, the same data being prepared, the same output deliverables. You can use that cognitive energy you saved to pay attention to um, other softer, more delicate human interactions during your post-mortem that can help refine your process. And then, then there should be actionable outcomes from your post-mortem. Um, if at the end of the meeting the conclusion is, let's try not hit that button again. That's not terribly actionable. Um, so having a tangible outcome, even if it's like putting an alarm bell in and a pause when you try an RMRF route uh, in production, you know, at least that's better than, than nothing. So silos are great for storing grain, terrible for storing knowledge because they're very isolated. Knowledge is meant to be shared both inside and outside your team. Hoarding institutional knowledge is one way to ensure you become a bottleneck in future. Uh, when you're the only one in the organization that knows something specific about the stack or some idiosyncrasy, you become the sole maintainer of that, and that's burdensome. So document and express that knowledge to other members of your organization so that they can maintain uh, continuity while you sip my ties on the beach every once in a while and you get a break. <clears throat> so unless there's a justifiable reason, open should always be the default policy. Everyone should be able to see all the repositories for an organization. There might be things that should be kept hidden. Um, so for example, credentials for the payroll system, that should only be shared with people if, uh, in positions of fiduciary responsibility because you know, who doesn't want to go and add an extra zero to their paycheck at the end of the month? So to that end, we need to con communicate effectively both inside and outside of the organization. Lines of communication should be clear and well-defined. So is your door always open if you have a door? Or do you want someone to call ahead and first check your availability? Do you have different rules depending on the time of day when it comes to communicating? You know, if somebody sends you an email at 6 p.m., are you expected to reply by 7 p.m., or will you take care of the next day? And with that being said, the communication channel should be succinct and not needlessly cluttered with extraneous information. So if you're having a meeting over something like Slack and someone keeps dropping pug pictures into the meeting channel, that's needlessly distracting. Like the pugs can wait for 30 more minutes. So, um, yeah, and you, you want meetings to be over. So if you, if you set it for one hour, it's one hour. Um, I got into the habit many years ago of running meetings that I would literally close my laptop and walk out the door once the time box is over because I had execs that would just ramble and ramble and ramble and never get to the point. And it's just 
needlessly infuriating. And after two months of just like, well, I was up, laptops down, I'm out. They changed their behavior and actually got to the point within that hour. So it helps a lot. <coughs> so I strongly believe in a culture of continuous learning, whether it's inside or outside the scope of your work. Um, I take random courses sort of every six months or so on random things. I lasted magic in the Middle Ages and recently did something on Chinese tea ceremonies. Um, so obviously that's, that's cool, to, cool to do, but the company's not going to go and pay, pay you to go and uh, take a 30 minute break making tea in the kitchen every time. Um, but you should identify places where you need training. So if you're spending say four, day, four hours of your day in Excel, but you're probably only productive for about 30 minutes because you don't know Excel, well maybe that's a, a place that you need training. So go out, seek it, and uh, rectify the situation. Or if you're building dashboards for clients, internal or external, and you don't know what the impact difference is between uh, various graphs and charts, then that's a good thing to go and study. It's a little bit of UI, UX, and uh, marketing information. Um, so I like 10% of my time to, to be focused on learning. Um, for me, that's one day every fortnight, which isn't really a lot. Especially when you consider that uh, on average people are only productive five hours a day. You've got a lot of time that you could be learning other things. And it helps uh, build up your skill set and learn interesting and, and new things that could help you solve problems creatively in future. So mentorship. Um, this is a, obviously a difficult point because uh, it's, obvious, it's hard to find mentors. Um, but everyone should have one. Um, and you should change them as well because the mentor you have today might not be the mentor you need tomorrow. They might not have advice that's pertinent to you anymore or your domain has changed so much that um, uh, you, know, you need to seek alternative ad ad advice. Uh, the various 12-step programs, I don't know if anybody knows like Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous, but they do this pretty well. It's called sponsorship there because you're sponsoring somebody's sobriety. Um, but you're there to help offer them helpful, salient advice to get them through their life. And very much so, that's what a mentor is in business and technology. And obviously, just remember that not everyone wants to be a mentor. So you shouldn't go and try and force people to mentor others. Um, it's something that's hard for a lot of people. Um, so feel free to go seek it from external people if you can't find anybody in your company to talk to. So cross-team pollination. It's a great way to ensure there's a diverse set of knowledge running throughout the organization with a bus factor high enough that you can uh, throw three quarters of your organization under the bus before you start seeing any cracks. Um, through the engineering space, it's quite easy to obviously just move your laptop and go sit at somebody else's desk for, for a couple of hours or a day or two. Uh, it becomes harder when you want to try and move to a team for two or three sprint cycles and you're ignoring your work though. So, make it a value for the organization, allow for it. A few organizations I know have a six week transfer that you can do internally. You can move complete teams, jam and a bunch of other stuff and they're completely okay with it because they've actually got in place enough knowledge and cross sharing that it's not a problem. Um, and don't be afraid to um, go to people that you might not think can teach you something. You know, you might say, hey, that person writes Java, but I write Go, what can they teach me? You'd be surprised. Like, don't, don't go and focus on thing X compared to your thing Y. Apples and oranges, and yeah, everyone can teach you something, and everyone can teach something. Hmm. Yeah, messed that up. <laughs> And explicit knowledge sharing. So this is things like brown bag sessions or lunch and learns. It's a great start to ensuring knowledge is socialized within an organization. Um, and it also serves a dual purpose. So it allows people to practice in the art of presentation, preparation, and conveying a message, as well as creating greater awareness of various processes and technology. You must remember that not everyone's going to be able to attend all these sessions. So where possible, record them. 
um, or at least a minimum make your presentation available as well as your notes for other people to peruse at a later stage. Um, and all those sessions should generally be focused on topics that hold business merit um, or something that's coming in the pipeline in the future. People should be allowed that space to share knowledge about subjects outside of scope of regular work. Um, so this, this can also inspire change. Uh, perhaps you've gone and built a set of garden monitoring IoT devices recording soil moist moisture and ambient temperature um, to enable water savings. And that's a worthwhile cause and maybe it'll inspire people in your company to, uh, to do something about their home gardening situation. So it's, it doesn't have to be about work all the time. So I've seen five levels of leadership in organization. Um, so the first level I found is the highly capable individual. This is the type of person that makes productive contributions through talent, knowledge, skills, and good work habits. Um, they tend to be the majority of your organization. And while they're great to have, um, you should always try and work to get them towards the second level, um, which is the contributing team member. So they help contribute to the achievement of group objectives work effectively with others. They're aware of others and the requirements uh, of working in a team, and they're also less likely to silo and turtle, and will hopefully at some point assist in mentoring process to lift individuals out of their state to team members. And we have the competent manager, and I'm sure you're a lot of rolling your eyes at the thought of competent managers. Um, they are hard to find, but hopefully you do know some of them. Um, they manage to organize people and resources towards effective uh, and efficient pursuits of objectives. They will hopefully definitely ensure that teams are not blocked um, and do not get unnecessarily bothered by um, things that halt them in achieving their objectives. Um, they're very much nice to have um, when you do find them. Uh, fourth level is sort of the effective leader. This would be maybe someone like your VP um, or dev managers, They're, they tend to be a catalyst for the vision of the group, stimulates high performance standards, um, and they ensure that the vision is clear and concise and properly socialized with all stakeholders. And the final level is the executive, which hopefully you've had a chance of working with some great executives over time. I know how I have. Um, and they strive to build greatness through personal humility and professional will. They're like the thought leaders of the organization. And occasionally, they might be gruff and overbearing. Um, and sometimes, they just come barking into your office and demanding things that they shouldn't. Um, they do help drive the organization to higher levels of being open to new ideas and concepts without the fear of being the smartest person in the room. Um, I mean, it takes a, a good person to sit down and realize that, hey, I'm not the smartest person here, I don't know all the answers, and I'm willing to accept somebody else's input. And all these traits help to stimulate uh, an organization that uh, should be consistent, available, and tolerant of change. So, rounding up close to the end, um, there's four steps I've found that help towards inventiveness and creativity. Um, the first is, don't assume that things have been done in the best way. Uh, quite often, a system is built using antiquated methods, and there might be new novel solutions to the problem at hand. That is not to say, like, always chase the shiniest ball in the room, but don't be scared of looking into new developments that might help you solve the issues at hand. Um, when a task or change effort emerges, um, encourage creative ways of getting it done. Learn to think outside the box, as there might be a trivial solution to that can be creatively applied to the problem or change effort at hand. Um, experiment with uh, different ways of organizing work and find alternative methods uh, of grouping and linking people. Having teams siloed with no cross-pollination tends to create an echo chamber of ideas uh, which hampers creativity and generally forces you into a change adverse mindset where you struggle to get out of the ruts of building the exact same mistakes over and over again. 
fresh eyes and brains um, can encourage inventiveness and creative problem solving. Uh, someone else might come from a domain where you're trying to solve, well, what you're trying to solve is already a solved problem with existing tools, frameworks, or libraries, but you, you might not have any knowledge of these domains, so you end up building in isolation what could have been done in three minutes with some said and orc. And then, when working to understand your current environment, ask yourself what other options are possible. Like that is to say, look at the larger ecosystem as well as the problem in detail and make a real determination on if there's a real need uh, for what you're planning on doing. Uh, it, you might have misunderstood the requirements and <coughs> the real options are staring you in the face. Ooh. So, some final thoughts. Like DevOps promotes a culture of rapid experimentation, which allows us to adjust frameworks over time and find the right fit. No one person has all the answers, and we need to take it upon ourselves to break the mold, successfully iterate to become the best individuals, team members, and leaders we can be. And yeah, I'd like to leave you with a quote I quite like from Bruce Lee, which has stuck with me for a great many years of when I used to do Wing Chun. Be like water, making its way through the cracks. Do not be assertive, but adjust to the object, and f you shall find a way around or through it. If nothing within you stays rigid, outward things will disclose themselves. Empty your mind, be formless, shapeless like water. If you put water into a cup, it becomes a cup. You put water into a bottle, and it becomes a bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes a teapot. Now water can flow, or it can crash be water, my friend, which I've always taken to mean that there's always a way to solve the problem or situation at hand, uh, provided you're not stubborn and you're willing to adjust and learn um, and you can see the light. For me, that's been particularly the DevOps movement because um, it's ever changing its shape to fit the problem domain at hand. And it's nice because the same day is never really repeated twice. And One, two. Um, for the sake of time, can we have two questions? No more than two. Hey, Christian. Uh, you mentioned that you switched to management six months ago. So what's been the, the toughest challenge or the, like the, the mind shift you've had to make? Getting out of focus, blindly focusing on, on work and getting things done and being able to step back and look at the greater picture um, as well as communicating with people. Uh, it, it's normally quite easy to just go, cool, I've got some tasks, I'm going to bang them out. Now you actually need to work on building those tasks and then communicating with other people in the organization. Um, I quite often I spend my Wednesdays till about 11 p.m. in meetings with uh, companies across the globe, which is horrible, but yeah, it's, it's what you've got to do. And it sort of breeds good, um, good conversations by, yeah. Hope that kind of answers. Great. Thank you very much. Um.